It's very difficult to us to make sense of the latest terror attacks in Sri Lanka. Reality breaks out of our screens, but news can't explain the complex, multiple and transnational dynamics of suicide bombings. Ian Overton has been there, taught to radicalize terrorists, and documented this in The Price of Paradise to help us understand what and who is behind an explosive belt. Sri Lanka has suffered two waves of suicide terror over the years. The first was the LTTE or the Tamil Tigers who were using it as part of a separatist movement to try and disentangle, disentangle the north, the Tamil north, from the Sinhalese south. Uh, the recent attacks were carried out and have been claimed by an ISIS affiliated terror group and their primary focus was on civilians. And these two attacks, whilst they have common origins in the notion that suicidal terror can achieve political goals, they were both driven by quite different elements. The Tamil Tigers traditionally mainly focused in their suicidal terror on strategic uh, locations. So around 95% of their attacks were against military or political targets. Um, they did kill civilians and that cannot be dismissed and they will always tell you when you sit down with old Tamil Tigers they never targeted civilians and that's not true, they did target civilians but the majority of their targeting was against military and political locations. Um, the recent attacks were exclusively against civilians and this fits into a much wider approach that Salafist jihadist groups or Wahhabist groups have perpetrated for the last decade or so that have been targeting civilians explicitly around the world and that targeting of civilians was very much laid down initially when Hamas decided to target Israeli civilians in the 1990s. It was picked up by Al-Qaeda who then used it obviously in 9-11 to kill American civilians on the shore of uh, New York. And then thereafter, it was picked up by other Salafist groups, Al-Zakawi in Iraq, Al-Baghdadi in ISIS, have both propagated this notion that you should, can legitimately attack civilians. Now, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka didn't attack civilians in that way and didn't offer that justification. Whereas this new terror attack in Sri Lanka has explicitly been the targeting of civilians. And I think in that sense, the, the recent attack in Sri Lanka has much more in common with, let's say, the Manchester attack or the Paris attacks or lots of attacks that have happened in Iraq where civilians have been explicitly the, the victims of, of the acts of terror. Trends show suicide terrorism was in decline over the last year, but attacks in Colombo show stats and trends do not help us tackling suicide violence. So the question is this, do we have to believe, as the Sri Lankan official stated, this terrorist group reacted to the New Zealand Christchurch shootings? Or they are hiding new forms of internal Muslim minority radicalization they might be responsible for? Well, yes, we have seen a decrease globally in terror attacks in the last 12 months, but this needs to be put into perspective. Um, 16 countries have witnessed suicidal terror this year alone, um, and we're not even halfway through. Now, you compare that to, let's say, 1998 or 1992 or 1978, where very, very few countries were impacted. I mean, 15 countries witnessing suicide bombing does not, in my book, suggest that there's been a decrease of any massive substance. Yes, there was a very high peak in 2016, but in 2018, 250 suicide strikes occurred globally. So we need to be sure that just because there was a massive spike, it doesn't mean that the issue has gone away. And some people seem to think, oh, well, terror, you know, Islamist terror isn't a thing anymore. Clearly it is a thing. Now, to what degree did the Christchurch massacre then fuel the Sri Lankan? I mean, it's very difficult to get into the heads of those who perpetrated this. And had they not used Christchurch as an example, maybe they would have used other moments where Muslims have, in the eyes of the Salafist jihadists, been unfairly targeted. 
Um, certainly, if you look at ISIS's long propaganda history, they have again and again used the icon of Islam under attack as a repeated sense of grievance. Um, we know, for instance, in Pakistan, that for every drone strike there was by the US government, there was an increased likelihood of one more suicide bombing in Pakistan. So, in other words, when there is a sense that civilians have been killed by Western states, this fuels cause for vengeance. So yes, the Christchurch may have been present in the debate, but was it actually driving force? I'll argue not, because it wasn't the driving force of the Manchester bombing or the, or the Paris attacks. They were all driven by this much deeper grievance that Islam is under threat globally, one that um, is very evident in a lot of ISIS's propaganda. And uh, it's interesting you trace the start of the suicide bomb era uh, to 1881 when the um, uh, Tsar Alexander II was murdered. And am I wrong when I feel we should not compare revolutionaries to modern jihadists? Well, revolutionaries and jihadists do share one singular trait, which I think is, uh, is a universal trait that you see again and again in suicide bombing. And this is that the suicide bomber believes that their sacrifice is worth it. Mm. Now, that sacrifice is often shrouded in this perhaps warped version or vision of utopia. And the, both the Russian radicals and ISIS uh, militants both believe and believed that through the sacrifice of their own bodies in the in the suicide attack, they will then usher in a better world. In the case of the Russians, they believe that by decapitating the head of the, of the Russian um, Tsar, that they would then lead to a, a social revolution that would improve a lot of uh, the, the peasants of Russia. The ISIS uh, militants who blow themselves up believe that they are also aiding and letting in this new golden era of Islam where Muslims will be able to live um, peacefully and, and joyfully in a, a grand new Islamic caliphate. Both the revolutionaries of Russia and the, and, and the radicals of Russia and ISIS fighters have this shared belief in the virtue of violence and that self-sacrifice almost amplifies that virtue. Mm -hmm. You um, uh, have made an incredible research, uh, historical research, and it was amazing to read how the uh, Russian revolutionaries went on by attempt. So they attempt first to place the bomb and then they fail, it was impossible and Alexander II was uh, no clear where they would pass on that street that day. So they just reached the point to which suicide bombing was the, the last resort. But now today, jihadists has a lot of choices as if they want to kill, especially civilians. I mean, to go in a church and place a bomb and not to die for that is very easy. So why? Why are they ready to die? The, there are two elements uh, of, of the reason why jihadists, I think, use suicide bombs expressly today. Um, Strategically, um, there is a certain assurance that the bomb will go off if you press the plunger. So in a form, it's like a highly sophisticated guided missile, um, and that requires the sacrifice. But yes, when the Russian radicals used it for the first time, they kind of had no other choice. It was almost like this was forced on them. They had repeatedly failed in their assassination attempts, and the suicide bomber seemed almost the last resort. And I don't think that's the case in ISIS. I think something else is happening in ISIS, and this is... The, this is something that's, that emerged in the Iran-Iraq war under the Ayatollah Khomeini, where the notion of martyrdom was seen to be virtuous. Almost death was seen to be better than life. And, and Ayatollah Khomeini, the Shia cleric, certainly glorified that. And the glorification of the martyr seeped from Iran into Lebanon, and from Lebanon it went into Palestine. And in Palestine it entered a kind of a Sunni tradition. Now Sunnis haven't traditionally valued the martyr over their centuries, the Shias much more so. But the, the new 
age of the manufacturing of the virtue of martyrdom under Sunni Islam, I think has changed absolutely everything. And within there it lies this basic promise to the martyr that if you die in the service of violent jihad, you will secure yourself a place in paradise. And alongside that is also a very self-aware realisation that the suicide bomber attracts a huge amount of media. And it's the media's fascination with that act that then amplifies the act itself. And obviously the, 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 the militants in Sri Lanka weren't intending on killing those civilians because those civilians posed a specific strategic threat to their life, no. They wanted to kill the civilians to create such an outrage that the West will no longer be implicate itself in attacks in the Middle East. In other words, the absolute ambition is for the Islamic world to, wants to be left alone and, and then to expand. Um, so I believe that the use of terror is justified in the eyes of people who do it because they think that by striking, just as Osama bin Laden did in 9-11, by striking at the soft belly of Western civilization, by killing Western civilians, by killing Christians, what they will succeed in doing, this is their belief, not I don't agree with it, but what they will succeed in doing is causing the West to stop interfering in the Islamic world. Uh, the Press of Paradise give us the incredible amount of data, figures, sources. This reflects the activity of action on our violence. And the, uh, um, uh, what are the main challenges and the obstacles to getting information about arms, production and all the parties involved, including the trade? And so. hmm. It was interesting, this weekend Amnesty International just announced it was going to be cutting back on staff and one of those start one of those cutbacks was an investigations into things like the arms trade. Um, the big challenge of the arms trade and investigations into that is this, is that the arms trade itself produces huge amounts of profits because arms e e equal profits and sales and those sales can go back into more arms and more profits. Um, whereas what we seek in action on our violence is a reduction of the global arms trade, a reduction of weapons. And there's no money in that. There's no, there's no economic, logical model for that. So in many ways, the world of research into the arms trade is inherently hampered by the fact that, um, as, as Shakespeare once said, nothing comes of nothing. You know, we want no arms and therefore there will be no profits from that desire. Um, and yet the reason why there's been such a massive proliferation of violence globally, I mean, we've, we've seen um, over 26 countries were impacted in 2016 by suicide bombings. This to me speaks towards an absolute failure of international organizations, of governments to address the globalization of terror. What what governments have often done is seek to defeat terror through military means. And I would argue that that approach, which has been a mantra since 9-11, has failed again and again and again. If the war on terror was succeeding, then why are we seeing civilians being killed in Sri Lanka? But what we've seen is the war on terror become nebulous. And I think we need much more pragmatic approaches to try and address this spread of violence globally. We need imagination, imaginative answers to addressing why Salafist jihadism has become so attractive to so many. And fundamentally, I think we need to acknowledge that the arms trade alone will not dampen terrorism. It will only fuel it. Uh, what's the relation in, uh, between the availability of guns and firearms and the escalation of violence, for instance, in Italy, uh, Salvini, far right leg, uh, and the arm is proposing now uh, to ease private gun purchases, arousing concern of escalation of violence. Well, there's one of the hardest things to do in terms of analysing armed violence is to absolutely prove cause and effect. 
Um, there are countries in the world where are, there are lots of guns per capita United sort of States. population. Well, no, I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say more that, the, that there are countries where there's lots of guns per capita and yet very little gut violence. And a good example of that is Iceland. Um, so there's, there's around one third of the population has a gun and yet nobody ever dies from armed violence in Iceland, pretty much. And, um, and yet that is, I think, partly because Iceland is kind of small nation state where uh, there's, the police presence is very much visible when it comes to gun control. You can't just get a gun. You have to go through certain processes to get a gun. In the United States, for instance, um, there's very little process you have to go through to get a gun. And I think this lack of regulation then leads to violence. Yes, guns cause gun violence, unequivocally, but unregulated guns cause even more gun violence. And one of the problems is if you produce lots and lots and lots of guns, the more guns you have, the, the higher the danger that they will be unregulated, particularly if you don't live in an island nation. Interesting, island nations, Britain, Japan, Iceland, have had relatively little gun violence. Uh, now, the case of New Zealand was terrible, but an aberration. It wasn't normal for New Zealand to witness massacres. And certainly Australia has really reduced the number of massacres ever since the uh, Port Harcourt massacre that then resulted in a gun buyback scheme. So generally speaking, I think the big, biggest issue is about regulation. And those countries where there is not regulation, like Central America, like South America, like America, will see large numbers of people being killed by guns. And what you're seeing obviously now in places like Syria and Iraq is where there's very little regulation of guns because it's been having conflict for so many years. And then on top of that, um, you have um, quite strident um, theological actors working, arguing that their way is the right way and anyone who gets in their way should be killed, then you see these massive spurts of violence where theology and ideology alongside weaponry um, creates a, a, a terrible storm of violence.